Um, there's a lot of uh, points, um, uh, misunderstandings. Um, but when, when they, when the disciples, the, there were 12 of them when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, when Paul said, well, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? You've been baptized to repentance. And I think that's an important point because too many times, um, and I want to focus on tongues um, right now and then how they prophesied and interpreted, you know, with tongues. Um, but too often people will take the baptism of the Holy Spirit as, as something and speaking in tongues as something that happens when you're in a foreign country and you need to be able to communicate, you know, um, speak Chinese when you don't know Chinese, you know, the gospel. Yeah. And um, whereas I think that's um, an important part of it. Um, Ephesians yeah. 6 also says, put on the full armor of God and um, pray in the spirit daily. Yeah. So this notion that they're in a foreign country isn't valid when they spoke in tongues and prophesied because there were only 12 of them and they all knew each other. Exactly. For those people that are watching and you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's very simple. You know, Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, my Father will give those, you know, will give those that ask the Holy Spirit. Just if you ask Him, that's all He asks. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to do anything. You don't gotta, you know, um, you know, do all this religious stuff and pray the right way and do this for so many hours and anything like that. It's very simple. You can be right now watching. You can say, Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow me to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you just go get into the prayer closet, get into the presence of God, and God's going to meet you there. Mm -hmm. It may not happen right away because sometimes we get nervous and fearful and we're expecting a certain thing. And, and, and I would say to that as well, don't put it in a box. Don't try to, to um, receive the same experience I received. Because what God wants to do with you is unique. Just like mine is unique. Veronica's experience is unique. Just like all of our salvation experiences are different. Mm -hmm. There's not one person that has the same salvation experience. We all were led to the Lord through different situations and different people and different circumstances. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you, you're going to be a witness to the power of God. And if you're going to be a witness, you got to be in a situation that's peculiar. Mm -hmm. You know? So, um, you know, just enter in to the prayer clause and say, God, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want that. I want that. And not even about the tongues. Don't even go there. Just say, Lord, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you will see the power of God's going to fall on you. And you're going to start speaking in, th in, 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 in words and languages you did not know. And you're going to feel an overflowing and that fire of God's going to take over your life. And those areas of sin and secret sin that you've had in your life that you've kind of been ignoring and not dealing with suddenly, there's going to be conviction and there's going to be a special grace that God's going to release upon your life in order to deal with those areas of your life that are unsubmitted to the power of God. Mm -hmm. So everything you struggled with as Christians, it's going to feel a lot less overwhelming because you feel God coming in and doing what God wants to do. Absolutely. At the end of the day, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing that a little bit more of Jesus will not solve. <laughs> yep. Amen. Okay. So uh, what was happening when you were speaking in tongues? I'm trying to make this uh, less scary. People can identify. I don't know. I mean, I think that, I mean, I felt like a peace I'd never felt before. Mm -hmm. I felt a hunger for God like I'd never felt before. I felt like I was one with the Father like I've mm -hmm. never been before. I, at that moment, I really could tell you that I had met God. Before that, I could tell you, you know, I knew about God, mm -hmm. but I had never experienced Him. You know, I knew mm -hmm. the Word of God. I've heard it my entire life, but I've never experienced God. And that, from that moment on, I could tell you, I've been... I've been I know what it is like to be in the presence mm -hmm. of God. So you were communion, communicating with him, even though you don't really know what you were saying. Yeah. But somehow then he was communicating with you, and you were just in that presence. And, yeah. Um, and at that moment, I knew I was called, you know, by God to uh -huh. do great things for the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah. Even had a heavenly experience. Um, yeah, later on when I was 11 years old, yeah. And started preaching with your own church at... 17? Yes, we started, yeah, we founded the River Church uh, around the time I was 17, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So now that you're a, dec 
a decade or so older. Um, yeah. Is there anything? You're dating else? me here. <laughs> <laughs> Big things are happening. Yes. Yeah. God continues to, you know, um, you know, just show us how great and how awesome He is. Yeah. And um, it never stops. That hunger and that thirst, if we keep that up, we will continue to see His hand moving, yeah. you know, everywhere, all around in our lives. Yeah. So, um, speaking in tongues, um, the Bible talks about our prayer language between you and Him. Um, and then there's other things that happen that are kind of scary that I want to um, pick up again. Is that when we're at church, um, a lot of the criticism that um, I have heard, at least over the years, that it's between you and God or there has to be an interpreter. And the scripture does say that, so um, there's not a problem with that. But, but sometimes unless <clears throat> it's done perfect, people say it's wrong and people don't want it um, um, done wrong. You know, and, and so so they don't do it at all. Yeah, exactly. I guess it's, it's kind of the point. You yeah. know, we need to give each other grace. We need to give you know the other person grace if they say something and you don't think it's right. You know, I mean, who are we to judge that person? Um, so, but you want to talk about that um, tongue Absolutely. speaking in, in church? Absolutely. Well, first of all, we got to change our our paradigm thinking about what church looks like because when we start looking at spiritual gifts mm -hmm. within the body, and we start looking, for example. You know, and, and the obvious example always comes up is the Corinthian church because that's where Paul really addresses spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. We got to start looking at what they looked, their services looked like. You know, they didn't look like ours today in many ways. Um, in their services, he says, you know, some of you have a song, some of you have a prophecy, some of you have a, uh, a tongue, an interpretation of a tongue, some of you have, you know, a teaching you know, um, doctrine. Uh, and so in their services, they really allowed the moving of the Holy Spirit and the giftings of the Holy Spirit through many people in the body. It wasn't just the clergy, quote unquote, or just the pastor or, or the, the staff that gave words. It was really the body was functioning gifts. And the, uh, I'm telling you, their services have to be very long because they're dealing with two, three people at one time giving words in tongues and then mm. there being interpretations, you know, from different people. Is that then, right? You mean in one church service there might be two or three people giving tongues and then the interpretations? Yeah, I mean, he talks about that in, in, in very clearly. Wow. Know, in churches, 14. churches back then were uh, different than they are now. Yes, yeah, very different. And, you know, their services were much longer, I'm sure. You know, obviously they didn't have the busyness in life like we do. And, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, they, I'm sure their services could have gone five, six, seven, eight hours, you know, mm -hmm. long. And then they would mix that with uh, the love feast, you know, which were they, they would have communion with meals, you know, so it could have been a whole day thing, you know, um, a whole day, you know, um, meeting. Uh, but, but that's the first thing is our paradigm of what church looks like is different. Um, not, not necessarily saying that it's wrong. But it's not like it was for them. And so uh, that's the first thing. So uh, the whole body was involved in the moving of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. Um, when it comes to tongues, um, the Corinthian church had gone so overboard and spiritual gifts uh, flowing in their services that Paul actually, he corrects them to come back into some balance. Mm -hmm. Whereas the majority of people that look at 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians and are looking at spiritual gifts, they have no spiritual gifts in operation, and they're trying to take Paul's uh, advice of bringing things into balance to basically um, say they're correct that spiritual gifts shouldn't be in operation at all. Mm -hmm. When really, we're here, they were over here, and Paul was trying to get them over here. And we're nowhere near that. So to, to, to really use Paul and what he says to bring correction to the churches of today really is a misuse of Paul. And it's a misuse of the context. Because, you know, literally Paul goes into, you know, how, you know, uh, how is it that you can have tongues spoken in the entire service for the entire service? And what about the unbelievers? They're not going to understand what's being said. Well, 
I mean, I've never been to a service where somebody spoke in tongues the entire time, you know, or, or the whole entire message was given in tongues. So to, you know, you understand what I'm saying is that mm -hmm. they had gone to an extreme where the gifts were in so much operation that Paul is trying to bring, you know, he's trying to reel them back in and saying, hey, we need a little bit of, of more, you yeah, know, yeah. unity <laughs> here because they were excited about the gifts and they were flowing in them, but they weren't really thinking about, hey, we got guests coming in, people that are hearing about us and they want to know what this is all about and they don't understand what's going on. Wow. They're coming into these services and there's people prophesying, there's people laying hands, there's people, you know, uh, giving words of wisdom, there's people, you know, going on for 20, 30 minutes in tongues and not interpreting it. And these people are going, you, you know, you guys are all wackos, you uh -huh. know. So you have to have some, some order you know, uh, in order for things to flow well and for unbelievers to be able to participate and even believers, you know, that are maybe more baby in the things of God so that they don't get all scared and run out and, you know, you lose those people. So that's where he comes in and he talks about when there's a, and then this is very important, when there is public words given in tongue, they have to be interpreted. And so that is not the prayer language we're talking about. That's not you are talking to the Lord. And Paul makes that very clear in chapter 14. When you're talking to the Lord, that's between you and Him. But when there's a public, if I stand up, and for example, in a modern church today, we would have a mic. You take the mic and you start going into a word in tongues. You have to have interpretation to a word like that. Um, because the rule with tongues is always... Who is the intended audience? Mm -hmm. If the intended audience is God, then no interpretation is needed mm -hmm. because he knows our hearts and he knows what's being said. But when the intended audience is the people, then interpretation always has to follow. And what if there isn't? Do we give that person grace or do we... Well, the interpretation by no means, Paul says, is the interpretation have to be from the person that gave the word. Uh -huh. The interpretation can come from any other person in the congregation. And that's when prophecy comes in. That's when prophecy comes in because prophecy, prophecy is when God gives a word to a person or prophecy is all, um, uh, in interpretation of a tongue is equal to prophecy as well. Okay. So that, uh, that word of interpretation doesn't necessarily have mm -hmm. to be given by the, by the speaker of the word in tongues. And to the average person, saying the word prophecy is even scary or they don't understand it. Yeah. It's actually quite simple because God's spirit, we're spirit, and the person that we might be given a prophes prophetic word is a spirit. So. Exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> prophecies, it, you know, it, it may be scary to some people, but it's very simple. It's, it's, it's God speaking to us. That's mm -hmm. all it is. Mm -hmm. God is speaking in the first person. And so... Whether that's instruction, whether that's a word of the you know a word of wisdom which has to do with the past, whether it's a word of knowledge which has to do with the present situation, or whether it's a word of prophecy which is about the future and what's coming in the future, however that falls into place, it's God speaking to us and giving us instruction uh, or giving us correction about where we need to do, what we need to go, where we need to go, or what He knows about us that we you know we may not realize you know mm -hmm. we may you know, me not walking in the fear of God and suddenly God brings something. And that's where tongues comes in. You know, he says, if they come in and they hear you speak in tongues and interpret correctly, and he says, you know, the unbeliever, then we'll fall on his face and we'll say, of, 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 you know, of a surety, God is here. Why? Because the secrets of his heart have been revealed. You know, the word says. So many times we lose those opportunities, even for you know, even churches say, don't speak in tongues because that'll scare the unbelievers. Well, what if we started speaking in tongues and like it happened in Corinth, we interpreted it and suddenly it may be somebody that was walking by the church and they stopped and they heard and they're, they're making fun. Oh, here they're speaking in tongues. This is so weird. And suddenly the interpretation comes and, and the Lord begins to speak to that person. You were trying to commit suicide. You were walking by here on your way to give you know your life but I Jesus am calling you and suddenly that person falls on their face and says, oh, how do they know that why because the secrets of their heart has been revealed and many times it happens through tongues I give you already that example in the first you know um, part of this um, you know this interview about you know how was I I was in uh, Cayman Islands 
and this German gentleman who was there, homeless and uh, and uh, and and uh, drunk, uh, was walking by a uh, gospel you know meeting that we were having out in a park and. I began to speak in tongues in the middle of the sermon. It was perfect German, he said. And I told him things about his life he had been thinking about five minutes before. So so, the, so tongues, because that's what I hear a lot about of people who don't believe in tongues or don't understand it, is they think it's just a, for a foreign language. But um, is there a difference between tongues, let's say at church, um, speaking tongues at church, and um, in this case, um, when a, you spoke German in a foreign language? Well, I would say that, you know, uh, the rule is when, when um, you know, this is an exception to that rule, what happened in that situation, the rule is always when, um, you know, you, uh, tongues are spoken in a public setting, mm -hmm. being addressed to the people, it has to be interpreted because it is, you know, it is equal to prophecy. Mm -hmm. So there has to be an interpretation, whether it's a speaker whether it's, um, you know, somebody from the congregation, mm -hmm. God will give that word to somebody. Now, obviously, we have to always understand, you know, that we fail God many times. And there may be somebody, the person that's speaking the word may have the interpretation and they don't give it. Or there might be somebody that gets the interpretation of the congregation and they don't stand up and they don't speak it because they don't want to be wrong. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah I and so that's have, what I have done that before where I knew that I knew that I knew what it was, but I didn't want to stand up and... You know, because we want to, we need to work that part of our, I guess, spiritual muscle and, and have that confidence that God is exactly. revealing something to us. But that's where spiritual gifts, and mainly the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues, it, it brings forth that idea of the body needs to work together. Mm -hmm. We all have pieces, you know, um, even, even Paul says it, you know, do all speak, you know, in, in tongues, do all you know, do all interpret? No, mm -hmm. you know, we, we all have our gifts and, and we, you know, we, we bounce that off each other. And that's where, that really goes back to their context and their understanding mm -hmm. of church is very different than ours today. Yeah. You know? Are we ready to transition into prophecy or you, do you want to talk yeah, more about go ahead. Okay. We're because good. prophecy, um, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One thing is when we're speaking in tongues or at, at, at church, or even with God, communion with God, you know, someone having a, pro a, a prophetic interpretation, yeah, um, which is the interpretation of tongues. Yeah, um, it's just a prophetic word, um, and and then just on a regular setting, meeting somebody on the street or needing to encourage somebody and um, praying for them, or um, just asking God, do, is there something a word I could give them? Um, yeah. They, it's all the same spirit. Is it? Is it about the same as you want it to is. address? It one is. It is. Prophecy to some people has been, you know, thus saith the Lord, and that's not necessarily what prophecy, mm -hmm. you know, is. I'm not saying that it, it can include that, but mm -hmm. I'm saying that that's not, that's not what it's going to feel like every time you get a word from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's going to be just a very clear. It can, prophecy at times can be a scripture. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. be. God gives you a scripture for somebody and you go up to them and say, you know what? You know, I know you've been going through something and the Lord says, you know, um, he put this scripture in my heart. And that's that's a prophetic word because it's it's a living word. It's mm -hmm. it's a word for that moment for that person. So uh, I think we need to go outside of the idea that, you know, prophecy is like this, you know, <clears throat> thing that, you know, so professional mm -hmm. and you have to use, you know, these and those mm -hmm. and it has to be, you know said such and such a way really at the end of the day you know uh prophecy is us putting into words something that is unspeakable something that the lord has put in our hearts you know and in our spirit and we're interpreting into language those very feelings or those very mm -hmm. words that the lord has put in in our spirit and so uh it's something that shouldn't be scary it's just something that we should learn to flow in because um, God wants to speak to us today. Mm -hmm. And he uses believers just like you and me, regular believers, to speak in the world today. And there's so many people that are hungry to hear a word from God. That is very true. Uh, the difference between a prophet and the gift of prophecy. Well, that's where there is some distinction. So when we go into thus saith the Lord and that type of thing, that, the, those are things that I see primarily in Scripture as something that belongs to 
uh, the office of the prophet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I think what separates the office of the prophet from just general prophecy is, is general uh, prophecy for, you know, everyday believers really about, you know, uh, encouragement, edification, mm -hmm. comfort, as scripture says. What separates the office of the prophet is the office of the prophet has the authority from God to bring judgment or rebuke and, uh, and to bring correction in a, uh, a territory, you know, a certain territory or over a certain local body. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and even the city, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to bring a word from the Lord, like mm -hmm. Jonah did with Nineveh and that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, and that's where I think some people conflate prophecy with the office of the prophet. You yeah. don't have to be a prophet to prophesy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you do have mm -hmm. to, you know, you, you, um, you have to prophesy in order to be a prophet. <laughs> uh, yeah. But the prophet, the office of the prophet has a, the, the main thing behind the office of the prophet is they're, they're called by God as an office to train up believers to hear the voice of God. Not necessarily to raise up other prophets. Mm -hmm. Their thing is to raise up people so that they can hear the voice of God for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's the main job of the office of a prophet. Mm -hmm. But then after that, some of the distinctives is, you know, rebuking, correction, bringing words of, you know, what we would call words of judgment. Uh, but prophecy, uh, you know, in, in the everyday sense, stays clear of that. Mm -hmm. Prophecy uh, is more encouragement, comfort, edification, bringing people up in their gifts and, and stuff like that. Uh, I wouldn't say that it, it doesn't at all bring some correction. It will at times, uh, but that's not the main thing mm -hmm. because the prophet uh, is subject uh, under the authority of God for the words he speaks. And that's why, you know, things like rebuke and correction and mm -hmm. bringing, you know, correction to leadership and things like that fall on the prophet, just like Nathan with King David and things like that. Yeah, I think we're in a society now from my perspective is that um, people don't understand the distinction. So I appreciate you bringing that to us um, because um, people's ears want to be tickled. You know, they exactly. want the edification and, and things. And so if there's a real prophet of God that um, needs to come and speak something, you know, on behalf of God, it, there's um, yeah. um, there's a lot of criticism, you know, against that person. So, and it was just like in the days of old. So this is just a repeated uh, cycle. So.